what we're looking at here are the stock OEM antennas that come with the TYT MD-UV390. There is a stubby duck and there is this uh, flexible long whip and both of these are portending to be dual band that support transmitting and use in the VHF and on the bottom it says something like 136 to 174 and 400 to 520. Keep that in mind later when we look at the charts for that transmit range and on the short stubby one it's the same thing 136 to 174 and 400 to 520. Now apart from the fact that um, a supposed dual band antenna is really just a compromise we are going to look at the other thing that affects OEM antennas apart from the fact they aren't tuned very well for the frequencies that you may be using or they might match one of the frequencies you're using this is what we're going to have a look at coming up uh, the other factor which we aren't going to specifically address which is why are these antennas about a dollar from the manufacturer and these ones about 40 times more and we're going to look at that and specifically what we have noted on the website which you may have seen if you've looked over the antenna page is the US government is what we cite for a study they did where they tested rubber ducks used for, by firefighters at the end of uh, a firefighting season. 60% of the rubber ducks failed and uh, now the California, uh, California OES Auxiliary Communications Service, they're the ones that recommend that all flexible antennas be replaced annually or more often if they fail a visual inspection. To address that we came up with the IPX6 which was a design that was originally implemented for the US Navy SEALs with the CPC 300 uh, dual wall tubing and with this antenna we had to adjust a few things because of the velocity factor that was um, changed due to this tubing. But this, for example, is my own antenna going on three years and it is still testing out to have all the values within spec, almost to within where it was when it was put into service. All the antennas are going to be tested and their results will be displayed on this screen and I'm just going to run you through where to look in terms of the results and then we'll probably just play uh, stills of the test results for each antenna to speed things up and make it easy to shortcut by using the timeline below to directly find the results for an antenna that you may be interested in. Starting over here on the left, here's the range of frequencies I'm going to be sweeping through from 140 to 480. The reason for that is over here on the right, if you follow my cursor, this green band looks at the FRS a window of uh, around 462. So I set this black marker down here, which is marker number three. It's set around 463.6 because that's where it came out. Conveniently, this green band here uh, that's about a little less than halfway across shows the 220 to 260 area which uh, some tri-band antennas will cover on their receive side at least and a narrower part of that on the transmit and over on the left which is the part that I'm mainly concerned with we see the three bars here which correspond to uh, roughly 145 to 155 and then again 155 to 165 and last 165 to 175. I put the markers number one and number two to be equidistant about 20 megahertz apart between 150 and 170 and when we are testing the antennas you're going to see up here 
the standing wave ratio for marker number one and it will be listed right there and then marker number two if you see my cursor it's right there and then over on the FRS side of things you'll see marker number three and what the standing wave is. Now for any given antenna if you look at minimum standing wave under S11 here that basically shows where the furthest extent of the dip in the curve is and that dip is the most desirable point of tuning for that antenna. In other words the lower the standing wave the better you get for uh, potential signal propagation. What we are looking at now for your reference is a dummy load and the line across here is showing the standing wave of what you get with a dummy load which is one. And now what I've got is the stubby rubber duck uh, for the UVMD 390 and what we're going to do is run a sweep on that and we'll see where that comes out. Now the red line up here is just to show you where the standing wave above that line would exceed what is generally thought to be acceptable standing wave ratios. In other words, a lot of hams and other users feel that a standing wave in excess of three because of the amount of reflected power then it's no longer desirable to use an antenna that's above that. Let's go back here now and what we're seeing is again this is the short antenna that comes with the UV390 and we see number one has got a standing wave of 1.9 around 150 and it's a little bit better when we get over here closer to 170 of about 1.83. Uh, it's the best it can possibly be over here at 231 and it's 1.034 as you see. And over on your FRS side of things if we look at marker 3 you're at 1.97. So it'll work. Now the question is, can you do better than this antenna? Let's proceed on from the short stubby OEM antenna that comes with it and let's look at the long whip antenna that comes with this radio and uh, we'll start with doing our sweep and we'll see here that we've got some pretty wonky results with this one to the point where I have to question whether it could be a faulty antenna. So now what we're going to have to do is investigate that aspect of why we're getting something that looks like this. So now we're looking at the second one we put on here and we are getting SWR within acceptable ranges just barely uh, for this long whip on the second one. Now let's try a third one and just see how that works out and you can see we're getting a fair bit of inconsistency between the same antennas that were supplied with our last batch of the UV390 and now look at the SWR on 170 here 5.39 and uh, the it's just acceptable on the other two. Giving the surprise and variability we've seen between those first three I thought I might as well just try a fourth one to get an idea of what kind of consistency we're getting between these long whips and here's what happens when we do a sweep of number four it is quite similar then to number three. So I guess if we had to come up and formulate a rule of thumb we could say that 
between 140 to about right here where it crosses uh, 150 that antenna is just within acceptable ranges it falls out of that range quite dramatically above 150 and if you get into the tri-band mode it's acceptable there and over on FRS it's acceptable the very best it ever does is at 231 we're going to move on to the last of the live demonstration of the antenna tests and then we will start with a series of stills that will allow you to use the shortcuts in the timeline below to go directly to an antenna that you might be interested in and we are going to you do this last one on the little 2 watt TYT radio the TC568 which uh, some people use for v or for FRS and uh, we refer to it it's the tail gunner radio and all these tests by the way are being done with RG316 coax a 20 centimeter section of it with SMA connectors connecting the antenna to the VNA and let's start the sweep on this little guy and see what happens with it and here we see a standing wave of two over in VHF but as this radio is not intended nor does it do anything in VHF we're interested in number three over here and that's 1.877 on the FRS frequencies it looks like it reaches its ideal range over here and it's just above 1.01 at 476 so keep in mind that this is with the antenna not having any grounding effect from a user handling the radio so what I might just do for shits and giggles here is put my hand and grab the base of the radio and see how me touching it uh, affects it and now you're going to see here where it does significantly help with that frequency curve over here on the FRS side of things and it moves our standing wave down to 1.4 when I am holding the bottom of it and I'll let go of it one more time and we'll sweep again and watch number three area and see where it moves and it's moved now up to 1.6 on that probably just some residual capacitance uh, left over from when I was holding on to it, the field effect there. 